Alright, so now what? It powers up, it seems reasonably stable. We can touch the center of the volume control and get home. That varies with the volume control. B plus seems to be low. Well, a few things. One, it would be nice to know if the local oscillator is running. That is this circuit down here. Now if we had a scope, I could just throw it onto the grid and see if there was a sine wave that varied as I turned the tuning capacitor. But we're going to keep it old school. We're not going to use a scope. So what can we do? Well, let's talk a little bit about how this actually works. Local oscillator is just that. It's an oscillator that produces a sine wave. It gets picked off by a coil there. And it goes right up into the transformer after the RF amp. In other words, they're combining the output of the local oscillator with the incoming signal from the antenna. Why would you do that? Well, I'm not going to get too into radio theory, but basically you combine those two sine waves and you take the difference and that goes through the rest of the radio. Now the IF frequency in this radio is 175 kilocycles. The local oscillator is either going to be plus or minus 175 from the received station. I don't know whether this one is higher or lower, but let's say it's higher. So let's say I wanted to tune into 1000 kilocycles, AM 1000. The local oscillator will be running at 1175 kilocycles. Now, how could we tell if it's generating that? With another radio, and we tune it to about 1175 on the dial, and see if we can hear anything. Now, it's not modulated, but as we tweak this a little bit and go past that point, we should hear some kind of whistle or some kind of indication of it. So, it's a little midget radio I restored a while ago. But it still works. It's good. Let's find a dead spot right around the middle of the dial somewhere. Let's go around there. Let's power this guy up. I believe that is the oscillator coil. And of course, it's shielded, so it shouldn't be radiating too much. But if we get the radio down underneath and around in here. You got a better chance of picking something up, I think. Especially because this radio has a built in antenna on the back cover. So let's just get it down in here. Just giving this a chance to warm up a bit. Alright, let's get this turned way up and. Tune this around. Awesome. Uh, I would say the local oscillator is warming. Excellent. So now what? Seems like the audio section's working. The local oscillator section's working. What's left? This. The RF front end, the first detector, and the IF and second detector. Now the time honored way to do this and the fastest way to do it for sure is to use a modulated RF generator. If we inject a modulated 175 kilocycle AM signal into the various stages, we should be able to find the problem real quick. We'll start around here. If we hear something great, we move back. If we hear something great, we move back. When we stop hearing something, we've isolated where the problem lies. If you don't have one, try to get one. <laughs> if you can't get one, well, then you're back to real basic troubleshooting. Get out your own meter. Check for continuity in the primary and secondary of every one of these coils. Check the tubes. Check the voltages on the tubes. Check the biasing resistors. And finally, check the caps. Now, luckily, these are a type of cap that really don't go bad. All those... Symbols, uh, symbols with the arrow in them, those are variable caps. Those are these guys. 
these don't get silver mica disease. It's two pieces of metal with a sheet of mica in between. It's not silver plated and you just adjust the tension on it to adjust the capacitance. They're pretty bulletproof. Yes, there are some associated caps inside these Bakelite blocks for uh, RF bypassing. Not super critical. Now, something else we really got to start doing is familiarizing ourselves with what we're looking at. So I see a coil, 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 coil. Which one is which? Well, I've started tracing things out. It's not always so obvious. For example, the antenna comes in this clip right here. So you might think the coil nearest to it, this guy, is the antenna input coil. No, it's not. If you trace it out, there's this red wire that snakes up here, and it's about as far away as it can be. It's this guy. And the one next to it is this next over antenna coil. So that coil with the red wire going to it, that's that one. There's the antenna clip, comes in here. And then that goes to this, and the RF amp. That's that coil. And then coming down here, these are the two IF, that guy and that guy. This one, I believe, is up there. I'm not sure why it looks so different from these two, but it does. And then I believe the local oscillator coil is that guy. So we could check for continuity in all of them. That's very tedious. You have to check these lugs and identify which is which. But some of them, the other lug is on top of the chassis. Which just makes checking a little bit extra tedious. Underneath this cover and this tube, that are all 24As, they have grid caps on top. So the, one of the leads going to the coil is on top of the chassis. So you get the hook and ohmmeter between this and one of the leads underneath. So I think you can see why that would be so tedious to go through and check every single one of those. All right, let's give this a try. And this is actually the period correct Philco signal generator from when this radio was around. This is turned on. There are no indicator lights. It's pretty bare bones. Um, we got it on the A range and dialed into about 175. Uh, I've got the modulation on. Uh, about mid range for power output. Nothing going to ground and I just have a uh, wire coming out of the high end. Now this radio is fully operational and all aligned and all that. To me getting anywhere near the underside of this with a signal of the same uh, frequency as the IF we should hear it immediately. So I'm going to move this around once the radio kicks on. Seems like it has. This RF generator is fairly accurate. It's not perfect, so I'll rock the dial. It's up near the IF. We're not really hearing anything, are we? I really don't know what the audio modulation frequency is on this, but it should be in the audible range. Let's go for broken just put this maximum output level. So why would this work? Because we're under, underneath the chassis where there is less shielding. If we were on the top side, there's metal shielding the cans and the wiring and so on. But down here, we should hear something. It doesn't matter what the uh, Dials tuned to because we're past that. We're injecting this kind of into the middle of the set. Try the tone control. And yeah, boy, we we are getting nothing. I will try hooking the ground up for the heck of it. I don't think it will really make any difference, but it will help to couple this more strongly. Now the next thing I'll do is I will actually find the correct points and physically make electrical contact 
at the various test points. But as I said, if this was fully operational, just dangling this anywhere near it should be plenty enough to couple the signal into it. Now the outputs on this generator are a little odd. They look kind of like banana jacks, but they're much smaller diameter, about to where a uh, the end of a test probe fits in. So that's why I have that. For the ground, I just have a length of heavy gauge wire stuck into it. I'll clip this to the chassis, and that did nothing. It's still on. Get our buzz. We are receiving nothing. Band switch A, which goes from 120 to 350, so we're definitely in the right part. And modulation is on. The only thing we can do too is this has a uh, audio range. So let's try and couple that into the volume control. Hey, fantastic! Except a very little volume control at one end. So that's as low as it'll get. And when it comes on, and then it's just almost consistent the whole way. I suspect that's a replacement. It's probably not the right value or the right type. Uh, let's see if we lower this level. Does it make any difference? Okay, yeah, so this attenuator does attenuate the audio as well. Yeah, this volume control's not doing a whole lot of anything. But, yeah, we'll, we'll get there. At least that's something. We have a tone coming out. That, that's good. So now, let's go back to modulated IF. And let's find a good injection point. So where can we go? Uh, how about the grid? of the detector. Now there are no pin numbers on this. I don't have no idea what pin that is or even what tube that is. So now I really have to dig into my parts placement and tube locator guide. Now there is a nifty diagram on top or on the side I should say. Side of the radio that some help it tells you what tube types go into each socket but it doesn't tell you what function they perform. However our parts locator does. So it turns out that's the RF amp. That's the one closest to these two. So that tube is the RF amp. And the one in the middle is the oscillator. I thought the oscillator tube was over here, but no. That's the oscillator tube. And the one next to that is the first detector. Uh, looks like so that's one of the IF tubes over there. And first AF over there. Alright, so we wanted what well, the first detector, right? Or sorry, the second detector I mean. So that would be this guy, which would be the 27 underneath that, I do believe. So let's try to find the grid on that tube and inject away. Yeah, okay, so there's the other 27 there as the detector amplifier. We want this 27, the detector rectifier. That guy. I don't know the pin number, but maybe from looking at the schematic I can figure out what pin we want. So it's a pin that just goes to a coil and nothing else. The other pins either go to filament or resistor capacitor or a or going to ground. Actually the plate's grounded. That's kind of unusual. 
Or we could go, maybe easier, be the, the plate of the previous tube. The only thing you want to be careful when you do that is, of course, the plate's going to have DC voltage on it. It's a couple hundred volts, at least. Uh, ideally, your RF generator's got a capacitor inside to block DC. If you're not certain, use one at the end of your uh, probe. Don't just take this and use a straight wire connection and stick it into the radio. Use a capacitor between your radio and the RF generator to block that DC potential. But that would be an easier thing to do is to just touch it to the plate cap because we can do that on top of the chassis instead of having to poke around underneath. Let's try the grid of the preceding stage to the detector. It's easy to get at. And that, that cap on top of the tube, that's the grid. So if we inject a signal into this, and this tube is working, it will get amplified, fed into this, coupled to the detector, rectifier, and so on. So if we get a tone here, we know that everything to the right side of that pencil is good. To do so, well, I just stuck a capacitor lead under that grid cap and pushed it down, and then stuck my RF generator output, uh, shoved the cap lead into that. Simple enough, right? And we do have it grounded to the chassis. It's not a hot chassis set, so it's safe to ground the two devices together. The radio back on. Oh, the radio is on. Okay. Let's turn it up. Huh. We have a tone already. Let's see. Modulated. About 175. Assuming this is accurate, the radio is off because it's peaking closer to 180 than 175. And we're doing, putting on a pretty massive level too, it's on the highest range. That's odd. The range isn't making much difference. The range switch is also a bit loose. It might be when you're on the high range, it bypasses that range switch. Let's give this a try. Huh, we don't get anything on this. Huh, only at the high level. And it's not doing anything. I have to pull out the manual to see exactly how this is set up. But I do recall that the multiplier works in the medium range and for the high range uh, it's just maximum output going through the attenuator. But hey, that's, that's cool. Um, I thought I would have had more gain than this, so I'm thinking that Problem could just be weak tubes or bad biasing. We know the B plus is low, so all right. Let's go back a stage. So instead of the grid here, let's go to the grid there, which is the first detector tube, which is this guy. Now it's going to be under the shield, so I'll have to take that off, which can cause some problems with feedback and noise and stuff. But we got to get in there. Here's what is underneath that tube shield. Remember, antenna coils, RF amp, local oscillator, first uh, detector tube going into the grid of that. And the further back you go, the more gain you should be getting as you're going through more amplifier stages. Huh, it's actually weaker. About the same, actually. And this is this is actually peaking at even more than 180 now. So at the various stages that are out of alignment, that's going to kill gain too. So that could just be another issue too. So it is possible that this radio is working to some extent right now. It's just badly out of alignment, and the gain isn't so great. So I would need to feed in a really strong signal to the antenna. How can we find that out? 
let's go, instead of IF, let's go RF, which would be the C band, and to some extent the B band. this, we would want to go to not much voltage on the grid, so I'm not really in any danger of doing that. Now we can just go right into the antenna. I'll put down the camera for a moment and hook that up. Alright, so same deal, decoupling cap, sometimes called a dummy antenna and alignment instructions. Just the DC blocking cap, RF generator going into the antenna clip lead. Now, let's see if we can actually tune something into volume all the way up. RF generator wide open, modulation turned on, on the C range, at around 1100. Let's see if we can tune something in on this, at around 1100 on the dial. And no. You know, you can also touch these caps, I should have mentioned too. Not that one, but afterwards, because it's kind of audio from this end on. You can get a little something. Huh. Though there is a little something, a little hint of something. Let's see if the camera can pick that up. Some off station. Um. No off. Boy, is that weak. So that occasionally we get a pop and then the volume sometimes goes a little bit higher. That to me indicates like a capacitor breaking down and uh, it's arcing inside and occasionally it's uh, arcing and making <laughs> uh, it work more like a capacitor. That makes sense. It's the tone control I'm rotating. Now the tone control are just caps going right from the plate of the output tube to ground. So you can imagine if those caps are leaky, they're definitely going to pull audio away. But there is a position at which there none of them are in circuit. So one, two, three, four positions. And that's not making any difference across the board. So don't think we have to worry about leaky caps in there. One control is having some effect. Huh, you can actually hear something too. Curious. I wonder if we're near a station and the two are kind of mixing together. Alright, well I know that there is an AM1000. That's a pretty strong station. So let's go to the B band and go over to 1000. I can get this under 1000. Hmm, nothing. Do I have that right? B band 1000, yeah. Now let's go back to the C band. Huh, there's a little bit of something coming out. Regardless of where I set the RF generator. We are getting some reception. Alright, let me go back to the uh, long wire antenna. Alright, we've got an antenna about 12 feet long attached to it. And yeah, we are getting some reception. We probably were all along and just didn't listen closely enough and didn't have it tuned to the right station. Oh, 
Also seems like that's the only station we can get. Which is odd because the more powerful station. He's doing any oh, wait. Take it back. Let's see if we can boost things by sticking our fingers in here and there. So here's the antenna input. No boost whatsoever. If anything, that makes it worse. It's a little unusual, often when you touch... Yeah, and turn terminal on the radio, you make it louder because you are an antenna. Well, let's try the grid of the RF tube. Nope, kills it. So I'm just... I'm loading down this grid. I'm swamping out the signal that's coming in. A very weak signal. Let's try the grid of the first detector mixer tube. Ah, there we go. So now I'm helping feed some RF into the mixer tube, boosting it. And the third 24, that is the IF tube. So I just feed some noise if I touch that one, because now we're past the RF stage. We've already detected it and mixed it. it mixed it and we're down to 175 kilohertz kilocycles so it's working we just have terrible gain could be weak tubes although I think a lot of these if not all of these are good tubes some of them are new old stock they all look to be in good shape of course I can test them but an easy thing to do is swap them around so there are duplicate 24s and 27s, so we can swap them between sockets. But I do have some other spares I can swap in as well. Also, it seems like the alignment is off. So depending on where I injected the signal, one was peaking at around 178 kilocycles, the other was at like 182 kilocycles. So we can try tweaking the alignment. Now this is old school. There are no holes in the tops of the cans for putting an alignment tool in. The caps are down below. One, two, three, and there are several others in other spots. There are holes above those. We need to use an insulated quarter inch nut driver, I do believe, to adjust those. I've got a tool somebody made for me somewhere. It's got a wooden handle and a plastic nut with a uh, hex recessed into it. I hope it's the right size. I'll go grab it. Here is my tool, wooden dowel, plastic screw with a recessed quarter inch nut on top. And we can put that through the hole on the top of the chassis, down into the capacitor. And tweak it. Look really close and see this capacitor. The plates get closer together or further apart. So I'm just going to do this by ear for the several caps I can see. I just noticed one more accessible via the back up here. Let's try that. That helps. Uh, this is not this, the correct way to do it. Strictly speaking, we should be using the RF generator set at 175. Now I'm going back through, so it's typically what you're going to do is go back through it again and again and make sure they're all peaked at the same spot. So let's take a step back and think about what have we actually done to this radio to get to this point. We replaced the line cord. We tacked in two new electrolytic filter capacitors. We disconnected the line filter from the line cord. And we hacked in a permanent magnet speaker and substituted for the field coil. That's it. Not bad for a radio that's, what, 90 years old? Sure, it's had some old repairs. 
which <laughs> I was a little unfortunate because I hacked up one or two of the Bakelite blocks to do so. But that's also probably part of the reason why it does work at all is that there uh, have been some old repairs. All right, so ideally everything we do from now on should make it better. But don't be discouraged if you don't. I mean, if so imagine this is your radio and you start, say, replace this paper cap I'm pointing at, or several of these. Things may get worse temporarily. Sometimes circuits are interrelated, and you fix up one circuit, it might start drawing more current, which has a detrimental effect on another circuit that hasn't been uh, repaired yet. But that, that's what we're going to start doing now. Um... Let's do something simple first though. Let's try swapping a few tubes around. Also part of the reason I think this is working, aside from the old repairs, is just the type of caps that are inside of these, which I believe are tar. These tend to hold up far better than just the uh, paper wax types. Or paper, or paper foil types, I should say. The tar impregnated into them seems to uh, help them hold up a bit better. Also a pretty well designed, straightforward, rugged radio design. Let's get to that one loud station, see if the tone control actually does anything. Not really. When it's just out of the circuit entirely, it seems to be have better highs, but the other three positions don't seem to make much difference. I imagine that cap inside isn't in the greatest condition. Alright, I will go grab some other tubes and let's play around with swapping them out. My apologies if I've been a little hard to follow. I tend to get excited when a radio starts coming back to life and I've been kind of jumping all over the place. Let's slow things down a little. I went down to my tube stash, grabbed some more tubes, in particular another Type 80, tested good back in 1938 according to the label. Let's give that guy a try. And I got some more 24As and 27s. I'm going to swap out the 80 and the first 24A, the RF amp. So I noticed the antenna doesn't seem to be doing a whole lot. So, let's see if this helps any. So we have a few issues we need to resolve. Low B plus could be accounting for every problem we've got. Because if the plate supply is lower than it should be, it's going to decrease the gain at every stage, including field coil on the speaker, meaning we have a weaker magnetic field. Question is why. One good possibility is that we've got a weak type 80 rectifier tube. That's what turns the AC into DC and if that is a little worn out it's going to choke the current going to the rest of the set. Alright, let's see what that gives us. Lighting up again. I have no antenna attached right now. I was a little surprised when I disconnected it a moment ago. Didn't make that much difference. It don't seem to have changed too much. So no antenna. It's about the same volume it was earlier with the new tubes. If I touch that business 24 tube, this guy, some kind get a big boost like before. Oh, but now I get a little bit of a boost when I touch the RF amp. With the other tube in there, when I touch this point, it killed everything. And if I touch the antenna terminal, a little bit louder. I'll grab my meter and check B plus. 
house again. I'm going to play around just for a little while, swap some tubes out, then we're going to start going through things more methodically. At this point, I'm just having a little fun jumping around. But that uh, will only get you so far. Man, yeah, 207 was still way too low. It should be closer to 300. I went through and replaced the rest of the 27s and 24As with more random used tubes. And much louder now. Alright, we now have a 50 foot long antenna. Let's go through the dial. Now, notice it tops out at 1500. Over the years, they did extend the upper frequency end of the AM band. Maximum volume. Nothing. Ooh. Yeah, longer antenna definitely made a difference. As to the, the swapped out tubes. Let's see if that tone control does much. This is with no capacitor in the audio circuit. Uh, so putting it in definitely cuts out the highs. I can't tell any difference between these positions. Except for that one where it's out of the circuit. Anyways, let's keep going. Get the volume back up. The volume pot I looked it up should be a 500k potentiometer. So fix it for me. And I'm glad I've got the second revision because the earliest version of the 90 has a more complicated dual ganged potentiometer for the volume control. It's kind of tricky to replace. But a 500k pot is, uh, is no big deal. See, what I don't like about this is even when it's all the way down, you still hear something. And I've, I've noticed that in a lot of early radios. Especially once you get them all tuned up and working really well, you can't get rid of the sound completely. So right now, this pot should be grounded. There should be <laughs> there should be no sound, but it is still getting through. Now AM 820, their studio is a couple miles from here. I don't know where their transmitter is though. It's not all that powerful a station, I don't think, but maybe their transmitter tower is pretty close to me. There's WGN AM 720, so the dial pointer is not, not too far off. AM670 and I think the last thing we're going to get is 560 if we get it at all. That can be tricky to tune in. These older radios. Yeah, nothing down here. I've noticed on early radios the low end often is, does not work very well. well. I'm not sure why. Alright, cool. Working amazingly well, considering we've done barely anything. I've mentioned the B plus being low a number of times. So I thought, well, let's check um, all the secondary voltages in the power transformer. So after verifying that at 117 on the primary, I found out that the secondary filament voltages were low. So most of these tubes were on 2.5 volts. I was getting around 2.2 rather than 2.5. And the 5 volt was like 4.5 or so. Uh, now before when I first 
powered this up without the rectifier tube in there and I measured it, it was 5 volts, but that was with no load. So when this thing is fully running with all the tubes and that, uh, there's more of a load in the power transformer and pulls things down a little bit. So is that a concern? Well, potentially there could be a shorted winding, maybe on the primary, that's um, reducing the output a bit. I would need to run the primary on this at about 135 or so to get all the filament voltages where they should be. And then, of course, that would raise B plus as well. Um, so what I propose to do is we'll continue on with the restoration, get everything working, and then we'll take another look at those voltages because there could be something, a leaky cap or two, or two being biased so that it's drawing excessive current that's pulling things down and, and uh, taxing the transformer. Worst case scenario, if there is a short in this, it'll get warm, um, could degrade further over time. We do have a backup. That chassis that we have that's been uh, heavily modified does have the original power transformer. Assuming it's good, it could be transplanted if we have to. But let's not worry about that now. We're going to continue on and um, redress this issue later.